This is your exam to review covering module two and we're going to start um, by looking at linear systems. So number one says solve the system by the substitution method. So in the substitution method you want to solve one of the equations for either x or y. The top one isn't a good candidate because you'll end up with fractions. The bottom one is because this x could easily just have a one in front of it if we divided everything by negative one. So that's what we're going to do. And that will give us x equals three divided by negative one is negative three. Negative divided by negative is plus two y. I think I can write that a little easier by calling it two y minus three. This becomes our substitution equation and it gets substituted back into the first equation in the x spot. So what you would have is 5 take out the x and put in the substitution of 2y minus 3. So you can see I did that in a different color so you realize that's a substitution. And then minus 4y equals 9. We distribute to get 10y minus 15 minus 4y equals 9. Combine like terms, 6y minus 15 equals 9. Get variables on one side and numbers on the other. 6y equals 24. Divide by 6 and we get y equals 4. Now remember when you're solving these, what you're always looking for, when you're solving a system of equations, you're looking for a point of intersection. And a point of intersection has an x and a y. So what we just found was the y part of the x and y. Now we have to find the x part and we go back to our substitution equation and we use it again. x is equal to 2 times whatever you found for y minus 3 or x is equal to 8 minus, whoops, I wrote my answer too quick, 8 minus 3 which is 5. My brain went too fast. So we have our point of intersection as the point 5, 4. So just remember that you're not finished until you end up with both an x and a y. All right, example 2 says to solve by using the elimination method. <clears throat> now the elimination method works differently. What we want to do is we want to get rid of either the x or the y's and the way that you do that is you make their coefficients the same except one's positive one's negative. Let me show you. You had this in other notes. So I'm going to get rid of the y's which means I'm going to turn them both into sixes but this one is going to become a negative six. I'm going to multiply this equation by three and that's going to cause this y to become a positive six. So you sort of have to see into the future a little bit about what you're trying to um, get them to both look like. So we distribute that negative 2, we get negative 8x minus 6y equals negative 2. Don't forget to distribute it all the way through. Distribute the 3 here and we get 9x plus 6y equals 6. Now we are going to, in the elimination method, add our two equations. These make a zero, so we accomplished getting rid of the y's. 9x minus 8x is 1x, negative 2 and 6 is 4. So I just found the x part of my point of intersection. Unlike the substitution equation, I don't have a real handy equation to go back to, so I'm just going to use that original equation right here and fill in my x and solve for y. So 4 times what we found for x plus 3y equals 1. 16 plus 3y equals 1. Get variables on one side and numbers on the other. We get 3y equals negative 15. Divide by 3 and we get y equals negative 5. And why I wrote a 4 here, I don't know. So there we go. Our point of intersection is the point 4, negative 5. So see, you can make mistakes even when you are doing a video. Alright, let's look at example 3. It also says to solve by the elimination method. And in this case, I think I would like to eliminate um, the x's. So 
I can do that easily by multiplying the bottom equation by negative 5. That's going to make these two be opposites. So my top equation doesn't need to be multiplied by anything. The bottom one becomes negative 5x plus 5y equals negative 60. The x's make a 0. Oddly, so do the y's in this case. That doesn't happen very often. So in the left-hand side, all I have left is a 0. Over here, I have 3 minus 60, which is negative 57. Now you have to ask yourself, when this happens, when both the x's and the y's um, become 0, then 0 out, ask yourself if this is a true statement. When is this true, that 0 equals negative 57? That is never true. So that says to you that our two lines represented by these two equations never intersect, meaning there is no point of intersection. So that's the first part of your answer. The second part of your answer is to describe the kind of lines that never intersect. They are parallel lines. Now I want to show you something. Let's just say, this is not this problem, but let's just say you had gotten an answer of negative 57 equals negative 57. Then you would say to yourself, when is that true? Well, that's always true, which means that the lines always intersect. So there are infinite points of intersection because they are the same line. They are on top of each other. So they, they are intersecting. Here's one, there's the other one. So they're, they're intersecting on, at every point. So either one of those things can happen and you should be aware of that. Looking at some application problems using systems of equations, we have number four. It says Bob fenced in a rectangular garden in his yard. The length of the rectangle is five feet longer than the width. First thing I always do is make a sketch. I label L and W, and it's going to tell you something about one of those, either L or W. Well, what it said to me was the length is five feet longer than the width. So the length is 5 more than the width. So it, I took that. That's a translation from the problem. And then it says the perimeter is 70. So we need to get two equations. Well, here's my first equation. Length is 5 plus w. That's a perfect first equation. And in fact, it's such a perfect equation, we're going to use it as our substitution equation because it's already solved for L. My second equation comes from the fact that perimeter of a rectangle is 2L plus 2W. But we know the perimeter. That perimeter is 70. So I'm going to make that substitution that 70 is equal to 2L's plus 2W, and I now have my second equation. Using the substitution method, I'm going to take this first equation and put it in right here. So it's going to be 70 equals 2, take out the L, put in 5 plus W, and then plus 2W. So there's my substitution. I should have done it in a different color. There it is. There it is, and then that went in right there, and then there's the rest of my equation. Now we just solve. So 70 equals distribute 10 plus 2w plus 2w. 70 equals 10 plus 4w. Subtract a 10 from both sides, and we get 60 equals 4w. We divide by 4, and we get w equals 15. and I believe it is feet. So I know that the width is 15 feet. Now I can use that in my substitution equation again to find my length. So the length is equal to 5 plus what we found for w. So the length is equal to 20 feet. It's a fairly simple application problem. All right, let's look at the second one. 
During the 1998-99 Little League season, the Tigers played 59 games. They won 15 more than they lost. How many games did they win? First thing we're going to do is we're going to say let L equal the losses and W equal the wins. So we are stating our variables. And here's what we know. All together, they played 59. So my first equation is the losses plus the wins equals 59. My second equation comes from translating this. They won 15 more than they lost. So the second equation is the wins are 15 more than the losses. And once again, I have a perfect substitution equation to put right there. So using this equation, but substituting would give me L plus, now take out the W and put in the substitution, 15 plus L equals 59. The parentheses are only there to show you that I made a substitution. Combining like terms, I have 2L plus 15, 15 equals 59. Get variables on one side and numbers on the other. 2L equals 44 divide by 2, and we get the losses, which is L, equals 22 games. But the question is, how many did they win? So you have to go back to your substitution equation and use it again. The wins equal 15 plus the number that they lost, so the wins equal 37. So they had 37 wins. All right, finally, let's look at this type of application problem. This is a money problem. New York City and Washington, D.C. were the two most expensive cities for business travel in 2009. On the basis of the average total cost per day for each city, two days in New York and three days in Washington cost 2772. I'm not going to finish reading because we need to get something set up. So let's let N equal the cost in New York City and W equal the cost of one day in Washington, D.C. Now all we have to do to get our two equations to solve with the system is to translate two New York's and three Washington's cost that. Two New York's plus three Washington's cost 2772. And then this one is four New York's and two Washington's cost that. So my second equation is four New York's and two Washington's equal three, four, eight, eight. Now this one is a better um, choice to solve using the elimination method. So I want to eliminate the ends, so I need to turn them both into fours, but one needs to be negative. Well this one already is a four, so I'm going to multiply this whole thing by negative 2. Negative 4n minus 6w equals negative 5,544. My bottom equation doesn't need to be multiplied. It's good how it is, so I'm just going to recopy that. And the rest is just calculator work. Those zero out. Negative 4w equals negative 2056, divide both sides by negative 4, and we get one day in Washington cost. If you do that division, you will get $514 per day. Now to find New York, we can go back to any of the equations that you want. I'm going to go back to this original one, 2n plus 3w. So 2n's plus 3 times what I found for the Washington equals 2772 or 2n. Multiply this out and you get 1542 equals 2772. Subtract 1542 from both sides and we get, let me speed this up a little bit, 2n equals 1230 divide by 2 and we get New York costs 615 per day.
and you have the cost of the two cities. That's a second or third kind of application problem. All right, let's look at one more application problem. These are the mixture problems that I rather doubt that you loved in class. Um, so let's take a look at these. It says a truck radiator holds 36 lo uh, liters of fluid. How much pure antifreeze, right there, pure, that means 100%, must be added to a mixture that is 4% to fill the radiator with a mixture that is 20%. All right, the way I showed you to do this is to draw a picture. So we're taking some of one kind, we're adding some of another kind, and we're getting a big container of the end result. So we're going to say let x equal the 100% kind, that's the pure, y equals the four percent kind. So let's think about those are amounts. So those go inside the pictures x plus y equals, now how much do we have at the end? We have 36 and that will give us our first equation. The first equation is the amount equation and it comes straight from your picture. x plus y equals 36. The second equation is the value equation. Now, I'm going to take these containers and I'm going to put their labels under them. 100% as a decimal is 1.00. The Y represents the 4% as a decimal is 0.04. You have to change them to decimals. And the end result, we want 20% which is 0 0.20. So watch what I'm going to do. To get my value equation I'm going to rewrite my amount equation leaving some spaces and then in front of those amounts I'm going to put their label. So 1x plus 0.04y equals 0.2 times 36. So it's the same two equations, it's just that the second one has the labels in front. Now, I choose to do, use the um, uh, substitution method. You could use the elimination method if you wanted and eliminate one of those variables, but with decimals I prefer to use substitution. So I'm going to subtract an x from both sides and end up with y equals 36 minus x that becomes my substitution and it goes right there. So that's going to give us 1x plus 0.04 times 36 minus x equals, go ahead and multiply 0.2 times 36 and you get 7.2. Distributing this, I get x. 0.04 times 36 is 1.44 minus 0.04x equals 7.2. Combine your like terms, 0.96, oops, x, supposed to be an x, plus 1.44 equals 7.2. Subtract from both sides the 1.44, you're doing this with a calculator I'm assuming, 0.96x equals 7.2 minus 1.44 is 5.76 divide by the coefficient and we get x equals 6 liters. So we have 6 liters of 100% which is pure. Now to find y I go back to this substitution equation. You can do it in your head. 36 minus x is 30. So I've got 6 liters of 100% and 30 liters of 4%. All mixture problems work the same way. Alright, moving on to some different topics. Let's look at functions and function notation. Number 8 says decide whether the relation is a function and give the domain and range. So I'm going to take my set that I have here and I'm going to map it by putting my x's here and my y's here without repeating. My x's are negative 4, don't repeat it, and then 1. Don't write it twice even though it repeats. My y's are 2, negative 2, 1, 
and negative 5. Now you map 4 goes to, I mean negative 4 goes to 2, but negative 4 also goes to negative 2. 1 goes to, oh, this is supposed to be a 5. This is my um, video of mistakes. Sorry, 1 goes to 5 and 1 goes to negative 5. I hope you caught that before I did. You can see that the y's do not have a 1 in them. I was looking too quickly. Now I immediately know that this is not a function. And it's not a function because this negative 4 goes more than one place. So does the 1. But as soon as I see that the negative 4 goes more than one y, I know it's not a function. I can still list my domain as negative 4 and 1. And my range, I'm going to put these in order, is negative 5, negative 2, 2, and 5. I put them in chronological order, numeric order. All right, let's look at the graphs that we have in number 9. It says decide whether the relation is a function. And in order to do that, we're going to use what we call the vertical line test. All you do is drop a vertical line right on top of that graph. If it only crosses the graph in one point, yes, it is a function. Do it again. It crosses in two points. No, it is not a function. Do it again. It crosses in one point. Yes, it is a function. It's the easiest test imaginable. All right, let's use some function notation in this last one on this page. It says, find f of negative 3 if f of x equals negative x squared plus 5x minus 3. So what we're going to do is right under our function, I'm going to write f of negative 3. And that tells me that every place there's an x, I'm going to put in a negative 3. So it's going to be negative, negative 3 squared plus 5. Take out the x, put in the negative 3. You do it everywhere there's an x. So here and here, watch your signs. Minus 3. Or f of negative 3 is equal to square first. Negative 3 squared is 9. So the opposite of 9. Minus 15 minus 3. f of negative 3 is equal to negative 27. Okay, let's do another one of those, function notation one. A little bit um, more complicated, this one. I hope I'm not giving anybody a seasickness by all these wiggling of papers. All right, let's look at this first one. It says f of x equals negative 3x plus 5 over 2, and g of x equals x squared minus 2. Find f of 2 minus g of 2. Well, in order to do f of 2 minus g of 2, I first have to have f of 2. So underneath this, I'm going to write f of 2. And everywhere there's an x, I'm going to put in a 2. So that's going to be negative 3 times 2 plus 5 over 2. f of 2 equals negative 6 plus 5 over 2. f of 2 is negative 1 half. So that's the first piece that I found. Now I'm going to find g of 2 because I can't subtract till I know what that is. So g of 2, notice how I'm doing it right up underneath, equals 2 squared minus 2 or 4 minus 2. g of 2 is equal to 2. Now I want f of 2 minus g of 2. That's going to be equal to negative 1 half minus 2. Let's just go ahead and put that over 1. In order to subtract those fractions, I have to have a common denominator. So that's going to be equal to negative 1 half minus times 2, 4 over 2, or f of 2 minus g of 2 is equal to negative 5 halves, combining the two that I have above. Just a process of going very, very carefully. All right, number 12 says refer to the function graphed here. Find the following. 
f of 4. Well, remember what is in parentheses beside that f. That represents the x. So I have to find out where x is 4. If this is 5, this is 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So f of 4, I'm going to go up to my graph, go as straight as you can. You may want to use a straight edge. And now I'm going to go over and I don't have mine completely straight, but that's the best I can do. Um, f of 4 is equal to 7. This is 5, 6, 7. We just did it by, by following our graph. Now, this one says, for what value of x is f of x 8? That means that the y is 8. So on that one, I have to find 5, 6, 7, 8. 8, and now I'm going to go over, I'll try to do it straighter than I did last time, to my graph and come down, and I see that that F, well, I don't know if, I don't think I came down straight. I think I'm really supposed to be right there. It's real hard to do that, but I looked at that sideways and realized it was crooked. So I think what we have is that f of 5 is equal to 8. Had I used a straight edge, it would have been much better, so I hope you do that if you have a problem like this and ignore that line right there. Easy mistake to make. All right, moving on to an, the next topic, we're going to look at dividing polynomials. We'll do a long division problem and we'll do the short kind. When you are dividing by a monomial, meaning one term, then all I do is split my fraction into smaller fractions all sharing the same common denominator. So I am splitting each piece of that numerator, each term, this is 18 a b c squared over 6a squared b c and now I'm going to go through and I'm going to cross cancel and see what's left. So 6 goes into 12 twice. This a takes out one of those leaving one in the denominator. This b takes out one of those leaving one in the numerator because there were more there and those go out. So on my first term, I have a 2b in the numerator over an a in the denominator. Next, I can't divide 6 into 10, but they have a common factor of 2. So I divide each of them by 2. There are um, The a's are cross-canceling, a squared, a squared, b over b, and c over c. So all I have left in that middle term is 5 thirds. In my last term, 6 goes into 6 once, it goes into 18 three times. I have more a's in the denominator. This a crosses out one of those, those b's cross cancel, this c cross cancels one of those. So in my numerator, I have a 3c over a. That is very, very different than the long division problem that we have um, below. Whoops, sorry. Get your drama meme. Um, so let's look at this long division. I have 5z minus 3 being divided into 10z cubed minus 26z squared plus 17z minus 13. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make columns. So I have a cubed column, a squared column, I have the z column, and then the number column. And you start by just dividing the first into the first. So you say, how many times does 5z, scoot that over so you can see it, go into 10z cubed? 5 goes into 10 twice. This z cross cancel one of those, and you have 2z squared. That 2z squared has to go in the squared column. So it's 2z squared. If you will remember, the next step is for us to multiply. So 2z squared times 5z is 10z cubed. 2z squared times negative 3 is negative 6z squared. Now we draw the line 
change your signs. Don't forget to change the signs. This should always go away. Make a zero. A negative 26 and a positive 6 is a negative 20z squared. Bring down your next term with its sign and start again. How many times does 5z go into negative 20z? It goes negative 4z times. Multiply negative 4z times 5z, negative 20z squared, negative 4z times negative 3 plus 12z. Draw the line, change your signs. That goes away. I have a positive 17z, take away 12z is 5z. Bring down your last term with its sign and start again. How many times does 5z go into 5z? It goes one time. So we put positive 1 right here. 1 times 5z. 1 times negative 3. Draw the line. Change the signs. Negative 10. There's nothing left to bring down. So I have a remainder. So what we're going to do is we're going to write plus negative 10 over my divisor, 5z minus 3. You end up with a very ugly answer. I'm going to write the whole thing. It's 2z squared minus 4z plus 1 plus negative 10 over 5z minus 3. That is the division answer. Okay. Let's look at one that is a little bit longer, a little bit harder because it has some missing terms. And when you have missing terms in a long division problem like this, you have to fill in um, so that there is a column for each descending exponent. So we're going to realize that in our divisor, we're missing a k, so we're going to add a 0k. in the um, Dip up here in the dividend we have a 4, a 3, but we're missing the 2, so we're going to add 0k squared. So it's going to look like this. 3k squared plus 0k minus 1 divided into 9k to the fourth, make your column, plus 12k cubed, make your column, plus 0k squared, make your column, minus 4k, make your column, minus 1. But it works the same way. You start by dividing the first into the first. So how many times does 3k squared go into 9k to the fourth? And it goes in, this will cross cancel, 3k squared times. And that's why you had to have a k squared column. So you put that here, 3k squared. 3k squared times 3k squared, 9k to the fourth. 3k squared times 0k, 0k cubed. 3k squared times negative 1, minus 3k squared. Draw your line, change the signs, all three of them. This goes away. 12 minus 0 is 12k cubes. 0 and 3 is 3k squared. Bring down. Start again. How many times does 3k squared go into 12k cubed? It goes positive 4k times, and that goes in that k column. 4k times 3k squared. 12k cubed, 4k times 0k, 0k squared, 4k times negative 1, minus 4k. Draw the line, change all signs. This goes away. 3 minus 0 is 3. This also makes a 0, but we're going to show it, and then we bring down the last. So that was kind of different. Now we divide again. How many times does 3k squared go into 3k squared? One time. Multiply 
that gives me 0k, negative 1, draw the line, change all signs, this goes away, this zeroes out, and this zeroes out, and this one does not have a remainder. You got 3k squared plus 4k plus 1, and it came out evenly. Just remember, the key here is you have to fill in the things that are missing so that when you need those columns in your division problem, you have them. All right, let's look at some factoring. It says factor completely. So on the first one, this is a factor out the GCF. So my GCF is a 6, as far as the numbers go, r cubed, r squared, and r. It's an r. t, t squared, and t cubed is a t. Now we have to see what's left. 6 goes into 6 one time. r goes into r cubed, r squared. The t's cross cancel. 6 goes into 35 times. R cross cancels one of those, leaving 1. T cross cancels one of those, leaving 1. Continue. 6 goes into 18 three times. R cross cancels R. T cross cancels one of those. And we have 6RT times R squared minus 5RT plus 3T squared. The next one, as you can see, we've got one, two, three, four terms. That tells me this is a factor by grouping. That negative in between tells me to make that correction on the last term. The GCF of the first binomial is x, and you're left with x plus 3. Bring down your minus sign. The GCF here is y, and you're left with 3 plus x. These two are the same because that's addition, so it's the same thing. So my first factor is x plus 3, and my second factor is the stuff on the outside, x minus y. Next one, I have a trinomial, and there's no GCF to come out, so this is a long process. I want factors of negative 60 that combine to make positive 11. Now we'll worry about the signs in a minute. Let's get the two numbers first. So we're going to start with 60 and 1. Divide by 2, multiply by 2. Divide by 2, multiply by 2. And I don't need to go any further because I can get an 11 out of that. I just need to figure out my signs. To get a negative, I need a positive times a negative. Which one is the negative one? Well, to have positive leftovers, the positive one has to be the biggest, so it goes like that. Now we are going to bring down, break down this into these two pieces. I'm going to write the 4 first, so minus 4k plus 15k. Now bring down the last. 1, 2, 3, 4, so we are going to group like that. GCF of the first binomial is 2k, and you're left with 3k minus 2. Bring down your plus. The GCF here is a 5, and you're left with 2k, oops, 3k, sorry, minus 2. These do match, so my first factor is 3k minus 2, and my second factor is 2k plus 5. If this was a test, you would want to foil that out and make sure that it checks to the original. All right, let's do another long process. I know it's a long process because of the 2 in the front, and it's a trinomial. So I need factors of negative 6 that combine to make negative 5. Be careful with 6 and 5. It happens to be negative 6 and positive 1. I want you to think a second. If you thought it was negative 3 and negative 2, that does make negative 5. But when I multiply those, I don't get negative 6. I get positive 6. So those are not right. So these are my two factors. So I'm going to bring down the first. Now we're going to break this down. I'm going to write the 1 first plus 1 of those, k squared, because remember I'm splitting a k squared, so you have to get k squared pieces, minus 6k squared. Bring down the last, 
again, we're going to group. I see that negative in between, so I'm going to make my correction there. GCF of the first binomial is k squared, and you're left with 2k squared plus 1. Bring down your minus. The GCF of the second binomial is 3, and you're left with 2k squared plus 1. They match, so 2k squared plus 1 is the first factor, and the second is k squared minus 3. Next one is easy because I've only got two and it's a difference and they're both perfect squares. So I know it's a difference of two squares. What got squared to make this? 4x. One's a plus, one's a minus. What got squared to make that? 5. And that's all there is to it. This next one is um, a sum of cubes. So you say what got cubed here? What got cubed here? And this line is going to have to be extended because it's going to be a little bit longer. So we make a short set of parentheses and a long set of parentheses. And it goes first, second, first one squared, multiply them together, second one squared. Now your signs, this was a plus, so it goes same, opposite, always positive. You just have to memorize that. All right, here we're going to use factoring to solve equations. So I'm going to be using the zero factor property. So the first thing we want is to have our equation equal to zero. It already is. Next, we want to factor. This is a short process trinomial. I need factors of positive 6 that make negative 5. This time that is negative 3 and negative 2 because they multiply to make positive 6. Since it's the short process, I use those in my factor. So I have completed that step. Now I apply the property by setting each one, each factor, equal to 0 and solving. So I get x equals 3 or x equals 2. So I have two answers, which you should always have for a quadratic, and my answers are 2 and 3. All right, let's do a couple more of those. Again, we're going to be using on all of these zero factor property. So just remember that zero factor property on all of them. So here I need to get this equal to zero. I do that by subtracting a three. That gives me six x squared plus seven x minus three equals zero. That is a long process. So I need factors of negative 18, six times negative three, that add up to positive seven. I believe those are positive 9 and negative 2. So we bring down, break down the positive 7 into a negative 2x plus 9x, and then bring down that negative 3. Now I'm going to group because I have 4. There's a positive in between, so no need for a correction. GCF of the first binomial is 2x, and you're left with 3x minus 1. Bring down your plus. GCF of the second one is a 3, and you're left with 3x minus 1. My factors are 3x minus 1 times 2x plus 3 equals 0. So I got it equal to 0 and I factored. But now I have to set each factor equal to 0. And I'm kind of running out of space. I'm going to put this up high. So either 3x minus 1 equals 0 or 2x plus 3 equals 0. We solve here by adding a 1 and dividing by 3. And we get x equals 1 third. That's one of our answers. Here, we subtract a 3 and then divide by 2, and I get my second answer is negative 3 halves. All right, let's go to number 24, again, using zero factor property. It's already equal to 0. We need to factor. Now, there's only two terms, but it's not difference of squares. So I'm going to factor out a GCF of 3x. I'm left with 2x 
plus 3 equals 0. So that factoring was easy. Now we apply the property by setting each factor equal to 0. 3x equals 0 or 2x plus 3 equals 0. Here I just divide by 3 and I get x equals 0. This is the same one I just did up here, so I don't really need to do it again, but I will. We subtract a 3 and then we divide by 2 and we get x equals negative 3 halves. And once again, we have two answers. This one is a little bit different because this 3 tells me I'm going to have three answers. So I can't factor this. It's already equal to 0. I can't factor it until I factor out a GCF and see what I've got. So the only thing they have in common is an x. And that leaves me with 2x squared minus x minus 28 equals 0. So it looks like this. Now I need to look at what's inside, and that's a long process factoring. So 2 times negative 28 is negative 56. I want factors that add up to negative 1, negative 8, and positive 7. Now I need to bring this x down, but I don't want to rewrite it every time, so I usually just make an arrow like this so I don't forget the x, and now I'm going to deal with this. So bring down break down that middle term into negative 8x plus 7x, bring down the last term, group, GCF is 2x, GCF is 7. So my factors are the x, that was the GCF, and now x minus 4, that's what they had in common, and 2x plus 7. And you can see where I have three factors. So now we say either x equals 0, that came from here, or x minus 4 equals 0, or 2x plus 7 equals 0. So I have three different things. Well, the first one is already solved. Here I just add a 4, and there's my second one. Here I subtract a 7 and divide by 2. And there is my third. So I got three answers using that process. Alright, let's look at um, an application problem. It says a rock is projected directly upward from ground level. So here's ground, the rock goes straight up. After t seconds, its height is given by this formula. After how many seconds will it return to the ground where its height would then be at zero. So we have f of t equals negative 16t squared plus 256t, knowing that f of t stands for the height. And we want to know when is that height equal to zero. So I have my equation and I set it equal to zero. Now I need to factor it. It's our, remember, it's still zero factor property, even though it's a word problem, so it's equal to zero. Now I'm going to factor it, and to make it easy to factor, I'm going to factor out a GCF of negative 16t. And that's going to leave me with t minus, negative into a positive is a negative, 16. So I actually have two factors. Here's one here's the other. So I have factored, I now apply the property. So either negative 16t equals 0 or t minus 16 equals 0. This one I solve by dividing by negative 16 and I get at time 0, which is at the beginning it was on the ground. Well we know that's obvious. Here I solve and find out that also at 16 seconds height was equal to zero. So there were two times when it was zero, before it got tossed up and then when it hit the ground a second time. So t is zero and t is 16. The one we're really looking for though this time is this one. Alright, let's do our last problem on this review which is a literal equation meaning we're solving for a variable. 
I want to solve this equation for k and I see that there are two of them. So my first job is to get them both on the same side. Now I'm going to subtract the bk. I have my reasons for doing that. You'll see in just a minute. And I get 3s equals k minus bk minus 2t. So the k's are together, but I need the other stuff on the other side. So I'm going to add a 2t to both sides, and I get 3s plus 2t equals k minus bk. The reason I subtracted the bk is because it keeps more things positive. Now how do you go from having two of the letters down to one? Because that's what you have to do. What you do, leave the left the same, is you factor the letter, the variable that you're looking for, you factor it out. K into K goes once, K cross cancels that, leaving a B. Now all I have to do is divide by the piece that is not K. And I get K equals 3S plus 2t over 1 minus b. Just remember that to go from having two of the letter you want down to having one requires you factor.